What were you looking for, Press? Uh, some Australian cats mating some bronze men. Cutting some kind of deal. Bronze men? I thought Valians didn't mix with Stevens. Shit, you've got me. That looked like them. Mother f clocked us. We gotta get these guys. Follow that train! You're on the train train. You are a warden. Get me close, Bear. I'm about to commit some rolling thunder on these guys. Take the high road on the right, Bear! All we had to do was follow the damn train, Bear. This update is the biggest update I've ever had to cover in the game thus far. We've got resources, facilities, trains, flames, rockets, tanks, emplaced guns, field guns, more tanks, and more tanks, and a few other changes to talk about. Bear, wake the f*** up. We've got an update video to do. No, don't make me do it. This update's too large. There's too many mechanics. So little time. Bear, it's a fake job to make these update videos. Come on, get off your ass, we need to go get some work done. Alright, alright. You're right. I gotta do this. Oh, and Versace, you got some f skill issues. Alright, thanks Bear. I'm going to try and get through it as smoothly as possible. If you're only interested in specific sections, there should be timestamps in the video, or otherwise they will be in the description section down below. As a result of the dozens of hours I've already poured into this video and other videos I've released this week, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I... it's... it helps. Alright. Let's do this. Okay. Let's rip the band-aid off. This update? It's complicated. It features a lot of new materials to produce, which can then be turned into weapons and vehicles. But these all stem from raw resources, so let's go over them real quick. Oil. Mined from oil fields, using an automated oil well. More on that in a minute. And it can be refined into several oil products. I'll discuss some of these later on. Coal. It's primarily refined into either gravel, or further refined into coke. The last new raw resource is water. This is collected from any water source in the game by a water pump. To be perfectly honest, there is zero good or simple way to explain facilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go down the list of buildings and their roles and purposes. Afterwards, I'll give a couple of examples about how to start setting up facilities and an example for producing a certain item, just to give you an idea. That being said, in one of the few times I'll ever do this, I'm actually not going to use in-game footage to convey this message. Instead, Rayboy and Jimbo from the Peg Regiment has come up with an absolutely brilliant web program to help you plan out facilities. It's called the Foxhole Facility Planner. I'll leave a link down below in the description. Let's talk about the automated harvesters. While hand harvesting with hammers and sledgehammers is still an option, there are now a set of automated harvesters once you develop the facilities and the resources to produce them. These include oil wells that can extract one liter or one can of oil every 50 seconds, as long as they're powered. The stationary coal harvester would extract 50 coal every 12 seconds, as long as it's powered by petrol. The stationary components harvester, which also takes petrol and gives you six components every 12 seconds. Do note that broken components can still be collected from these harvesters, even if the components field has run dry. These broken components can then be refined for some amount of components. Essentially, you'll always have a stream of components, although sometimes they will require an extra step when the fields are empty. Stationary scrap harvesters will harvest 50 salvage every 12 seconds when powered by petrol. Stationary sulfur harvesters require heavy oil in order to extract 6 sulfur every 12 seconds. And lastly is the water pump, which will extract 1 liter or 1 bottle of water every 50 seconds. Do note 
that automatic harvesters can only be built up to three per resource field. You will not be able to place more than that. On a related topic, there's been several changes to fuel. The drivable fuel tanker trucks have had their total holding capacity decreased as part of balancing for power in facilities. That being said, their actual inventory slots have increased from 2 to 25. Note though that to minimize this impact, uh, the devs have made several changes, including reducing the input requirement of salvage, sulfur, and component mines, meaning that you will be able to keep these mines fueled for longer without having to go to them, and that all vehicles have had their fuel consumption rates reduced by 50%, meaning you can drive twice the distance on the same tank of gas. Lastly, you should be able to produce petrol at facilities in much more abundance, though the challenge will now be moving it around. Trains. Also, resource mines have had their diesel consumption greatly reduced to account for the transportation bottleneck, and engine room bunker modifications have had their diesel consumption also halved to reduce the strain on transportation. Additionally, new static fuel containers that are transportable by cranes are placeable and store a high volume of liquids, including the fuels, and can be hooked up to nearby structures or vehicles so that you can refuel directly from them. For builders, notice that you now have a new building menu, and you can access this without having to pull out your hammer. Let's go through these tab by tab. The first tab is your field defenses. Pretty standard, barbed wire, sandbags, pillboxes, tank traps, observation towers, the standard stuff you're pretty used to by at this point. If you flip over to the second tab, that's your trench buildings. So you need a shovel for these, and it's your standard trench lines, bunkers, and foxholes, of course. Third one over is constructible support equipment. That includes campfires, cranes, construction vehicles, outposts, FOBs, medical tents, motorboats, signs, boxes, and field bridges. Skipping over to the next one is the Facilities Build menu. These are the facilities you're able to build once you lay down a foundation. After that is your Automated Mine section. These can only be specifically placed near resource fields, but will help you to automatically mine them. The next tab over is your Power tab. This is to help power your facilities. And lastly is the Foundations Build menu. These are the foundation pieces, or flat building blocks, with which you can build your facilities on top of. You'll need these to start building your facilities. Okay, let's start with the foundations, since that's the basis for everything. Your first couple of pieces are various size of foundations. All of these will need to be built using gravel, which is refined, recall, from coal. You've got your standard corner pieces, a 1x1, one 2x1, one, 2x2, two and this other interesting one is a provisional road. This is also built using gravel. These are basically custom roads you can build just about anywhere that's flat enough on the map, as long as it's not interrupted by an object, of course. They aren't quite as efficient as regular roads, but they're certainly better than traveling off-road. They are a little expensive to maintain, so best only use these in areas you know have high traffic and high benefit to your faction. Moving down the line, we have a couple of sets of train tracks. The first three are for light gauge railways, the smaller set of trains. You've got your standard light gauge railway track, but you also have a foundation railway track. In order to connect railway tracks on regular terrain to ones on foundation plots, you'll have to place one on the regular terrain, then use this foundation specific one to bring it up so that you can connect the two. And then you've also got your offshoots. So if you make a straight railway track, you can use this one to make an offshoot and split the line. You can get pretty complex with these. These will conform to terrain fairly well, so there is a lot of flexibility with navigating around objects or going up slopes with them. The next three function identically, except they are for a large gauge railway, so for the big trains but they operate pretty much in the exact same way for builders. Note that the railways will require you to build them with processed construction materials. These are a step up from the regular construction materials, which are a step up from basic materials. 
Last on this build menu is the Crane Railway Track. This has one specific purpose, and that is for large player-made cranes, such as the Sky Hauler. This one requires the resource of steel construction materials, which, again, is a step up from processed construction materials, which is a step up from construction materials, which is a step up from basic materials or salvage. You, you get the basic point. This is supposed to be the end goal for logistics and builders. All right, every facility is gonna need power. The first power plant you'll be able to build is the diesel one. It'll cost you some basic materials and give you five megawatts of power every 45 seconds, as long as it's fueled up. You can then upgrade the diesel power plant into a petrol power plant, which then takes in petrol, but produces 12 megawatts every 90 seconds. A big step up from that is the power station that uses processed construction materials in order to build. It takes in oil mined from oil fields to produce 10 megawatts of power. It's also got an alternate function mode where it can take in coal and water to produce the same 10 megawatts of power. It really just depends on which resource you have access to. This can then be upgraded to a sulfuric reactor power station that takes in heavy oil and produces 16 megawatts of power every two minutes, plus an additional five sulfur along with it as a byproduct. Or you can use coal and water to produce 16 megawatts of power every two minutes with an additional five sulfur as a byproduct. In order to feed this power to your facility stations, you'll need to connect them using a set of power poles built with B-mats and power lines also built with B-mats. These can stretch a fair distance, though keep in mind that power poles can only take in four connections from power lines per pole, so don't overstack them. Now let's discuss each of the buildings in the facilities tab. There's really no easy way of getting through this in this update video, so I'm just going to group these up by similar building types. I'll explain briefly what each of these buildings does, and then afterwards I'll give you an example of how to get started on building facilities. Hopefully that will give you enough of a basis to go off of, with enough room to also explore on your own. Let's start with the maintenance tunnels, as these are one of the most important objects. These can be placed around to prevent decay by providing garrison supplies to nearby facility structures. Note that facility buildings, including foundations for facilities, use two garrison supplies per hour. Some buildings, the more complicated ones, will actually use even more. That being said, if you stock these tunnels with construction materials, garrison supplies will be produced automatically and fed to structures within 40 meters of these tunnels. Realistically, a facility should only need a handful of tunnels unless you're going really crazy with it. The materials factory. Essentially, this is the basis to start any facility in terms of production. It converts scrap into construction materials. There's four upgrade paths for material factories. Forge takes additional coke and or petrol to create assembly materials one and two. The metal press upgrade takes additional petrol to produce more construction materials faster. The smelter takes in additional coke to produce more construction materials faster as well. And the recycler takes scrap and spits out construction materials, but also some sandbags or barbed wire as byproducts. The material transfer station, used for storing materials and being able to quickly transfer them off and onto trucks. The liquid transfer station. This station stores a large amount of liquid such as water, diesel, petrol, oil, enriched oil, and heavy oils. Be sure not to mix them up. The resource transfer station is a bin that stores raw resources like scrap, sulfur, and components. Use these to dump your logistical runs into. The coal refinery, as the name suggests, it refines coal into coke, used to fuel trains or power power plants. This also has three upgrade paths. The coke furnace allows you to break coal down into non-volatile coke and sulfur. The coal liquefier, which breaks the coal down into synthetic oils and the advanced coal liquefier, which breaks coal down into coke and heavy oils. Next up is the oil refinery. 
It refines oil into other forms of oil, for fuel, or for flame weapons. This also has three upgrade paths. The reformer, which uses oil and water to convert into petrol. The cracking unit, which enriches the oil through a process to make heavy oil. And the petrochemical plant, which takes sulfur and heavy oil and turns it into enriched oil. Next, let's talk about cranes. First off is the BMS Foreman Stacker. Pretty standard crane. Build it anywhere you want in your facilities and use it to move crates around. The big one, as we alluded to earlier, is the BMS Overseer Sky Hauler. It's a large crane that operates off a rail system. It's got massive reach and can move over vehicles, structures, and can lift the heaviest tanks and train cars. Next up, we've got the three pipelines. The standard pipeline, the overhead pipeline, and the underground pipeline. These help to transfer liquid automatically on, over, or underground, respectively. The pipeline valve is an attachment piece that can go onto any part of the pipeline that's not overhead or underground. It helps to control the flow rates in pipelines with the help of a wrench. Catwalks. Catwalk stairs and catwalk bridge. Pretty straightforward. They're an elevated walkway for foot traffic and can also give you a nice vantage point. Next up is the assembly stations. First is the light vehicle assembly station. These off the bat can produce pallets, trucks, and rail cars. They can be upgraded to the motor pool for armored cars. The rocket factory for rocket artillery. The field station for scout tanks, field cannons, and harvesters. The tank factory for, well, tanks. and the weapon platform for field guns and special tanks. The ammunition factory uses construction materials and heavy explosives to produce flame ammo and 250 millimeter shells off the bat. This can be upgraded to the rocket factory, which produces incendiary and explosive rocket munitions, or a large shell factory to produce 75 94.5, 300, 120, and 150 millimeter ammo. Basically, all of the big guns. The Metalwork Factory. It takes construction materials and components to produce processed construction materials, which can then be used to make things like pipes and build more intensive structures, such as the large gauge railways and eventually the crane railways. This also has three upgrades. The blast furnace gives it the ability to produce assembly materials 3 and 4 and processed construction materials. The recycler upgrade can produce processed construction materials and metal beams or components. And the engineering station can produce assembly materials 5 or steel construction materials. We're going to backtrack just a little bit. It makes sense for the next building we'll be talking about. In terms of upgrading your vehicles, here's how it'll work now. The tech tree no longer contains every single variant of every single vehicle your faction can unlock. You'll never have to choose between a 30mm tankette or a 12.7mm tankette. Instead, now you will just get the most basic version of the vehicle in the tech tree. Once that is unlocked, you can then take these vehicles back to their respective vehicle assembly station, and using assembly materials and construction materials, you can upgrade those vehicles to side variants of them. So for example, I'm taking this outlaw to the light assembly station with the tank assembly upgrade. Select the modification I want, in this case, the highwayman, and upgrade it. Now, you have a highwayman. The nice thing about this is it gives you tactical freedom to choose which vehicles you want at what time. Now, the next building I want to talk about is the Modification Center. This oh is the building you use to upgrade your vehicle in tiers. Hey. So I take the Highwayman, plop it into the garage of the Modification Center, select the upgrade I want, which is the Tier 2 Highwayman, and now 
I've got a tier 2 Highwayman, ready for action. And lastly, the large assembly factory. Off the bat, it produces the large gauge trains, the locomotive, and the cargo cars for it. There are two upgrades for this. The train assembly produces train combat cars, and the heavy tank assembly produces battle tanks and super tanks. Okay, so now that I've explained what every building does individually, I'm going to show you an example of how to start off building a facility. This will not be a complete walkthrough from start to finish for every building, or we're going to be here for a couple of hours. Hopefully, this will just help to get you started. Ah yes, the infamous I saw a bear. Bear with me, the bear factory. The best uh, build in the game. First off, grab yourself a truck and start heading the nearest coal field. This is pretty much the basis for any facility. You'll need to refine the coal to extract gravel from it. You'll see here that I'm choosing an easy example at the Great Warden Dam. It's got a coal field, salvage mines and salvage fields, as well as a refinery nearby. These will be crucial for the starting phase. Once you're at the coal field, extract an entire regular truck full of coal. Notice I'm just using a regular truck. There are more efficient ways to do many of the steps in the process I'm about to show, but this is just a bare bones example. Bring the truck all the way back to the refinery and start refining for gravel. While you're waiting for the gravel to be refined, hop back in your truck and head to the nearest salvage field. Grab a truck full of that, bring it back to the refinery, and refine it for B-mats. Once those are cooking, head back to the salvage field, gather more salvage, and again, bring it back to the refinery. This time you'll want to refine it for fuel. That being said, my mistake here was refining all of this for fuel. Putting a few extra into B-mats might have helped as well. So if you have any spare B-mats, or if you can find some laying around, build yourself a construction vehicle, as you'll need that for constructing the facility. By this point in time, your coal should have been completely refined into gravel, as well as a majority of your B-mats, if not all of them. Grab the construction materials. Pile them into your CV. Start construction of your facility by placing down foundation pieces. Here, I'm choosing two 2x2 two two pieces. But if you're more efficient with your space usage, you could actually drop it down to an even smaller platform. Keep in mind, these foundation pieces will consume garrison supplies. So the smaller your footprint, the more efficient your facility and less resources it will take. Once you've got a significant foundation base down, start with the main first building the power plant. You'll need this to generate power so that your facility can actually function. This is where the fuel will come in later. Once the power plant is built, build a materials factory. This is where construction material, which is crucial in building pretty much every other type of building in facilities, will be made from. All right, quick pause in this section here. This was recorded during the early stage of the dev branch. However, some changes were made. Notice how my buildings are hanging off the edge of the foundation pieces. You are no longer able to do that in the final build, but I assure you that my setup, according to the facility planner, would still actually fit on the foundation pieces as I have laid them in this example. Carry on. Place it down, construct it, and in my case, realize that the power link-ups are in the wrong spots. We'll deal with that later. At tier one, facilities are gonna have to be fueled by hand, but of course these will be made more efficient later on by the fuel pipes and other fuel storage buildings. Be sure to turn your facility and power plant off to start with. If you leave it on, fuel will be used, but nothing will be produced from it. Notice where the power connectors are on your buildings. Probably best you do that before you start building, unlike I did in this example. But that just means I'm gonna have to place a few extra power poles than was really necessary. Construct your power poles. Then link up all the power points with power lines. Again, recall that my power plant is turned off in this example, so no lights, no electricity will be generated until I turn it back on. If you've had time between all these steps, or if you've gathered extra on the side, put any salvage you have into the materials factory. This will be the basis for construction materials. Flip your materials factory on, flip your power plant on, and watch the light show. This means your facility has power, and you are now producing construction material. This is basically the first step in any facility that you're going to be building. Remember that building an entire facility with every single building and every single possibility is likely not going to happen. You're going to want to specialize your facility in a nearby local resource or design it to build specific items or for a specific purpose. 
From here, you can go ahead and upgrade your materials factory to be able to specialize or produce increased amounts of materials based on whichever upgrade you choose. And any spare B mats or construction materials you have or produce can be used to add on new buildings to your facility. And these can get excessive and wild, but remember there will be costs associated with building them large, so more efficient, small-scale facilities might be the way to go. I just want to point out that the entire process that I've shown in this small segment took me about 40 minutes to do on my own, and I wasn't even doing it at the highest level of efficiency. If you're working together with friends or teammates, this process will be much faster. And even larger groups of regiments can and have already started trading resources with each other. If you're on the same team, work together. You'll achieve far more than you could on your own or in small groups. I also want to give a shout out to Freerk, a longtime community member and content creator who recently has been updating a lot of his tutorial videos. So if you need a bit more details, I would highly recommend checking out his channel. All right, it's finally time to talk about Train. Train, train, you are a warden at war. You brought the pain, pain, and joined the Mammonic Corps. You heard a bang, bang. And then it started to shake. Let's start off with the light gauge railway. Now I've already talked about how to build railway tracks, so let's just focus on the trains themselves. The light gauge railway is built at the light vehicle assembly station that you created in your facility. You should be able to build all the light gauge railway cars at the light vehicle assembly station without having to upgrade it. The first piece is the BMS Mineseeker. This is the train's locomotive and will power the train using coal. The Mineseeker is capable of towing up to four other light gauge cars behind it. The second car type you can build is the BMS Rail Truck. This is a small flatbed car meant for carrying large resources and munitions. It's great for transporting shells to forward firing positions or carrying large items around facilities, especially when it comes to processed construction materials as those do not stack inside vehicles like construction vehicles. The third car is the BMS Line Runner, which is a small painter car for transporting raw materials. Once each piece of the small gauge train is built, use a crane to transport each piece to a nearby rail track. Once the pieces you require are placed on the track, back the locomotive up into a car behind it and select the option to link the cars together. Do this for each piece and you've got your train. Here's an example. We're feeding this car full of line runners out to these resource mines. If you're the driver of the locomotive, you can access every car in the train from your inventory menu. You can load up each of these cars individually and carry all these resources back to your facility. They might look small, but these small gauge railways can carry a load of materials back to a facility for processing. They are far more efficient than any other method we've had before. When you come to a split in the rails, be sure the split gauge is pointing you down the correct path you wish to take. You'll likely have to have someone disembark in order to switch it ahead of you. For the large gauge rail trains, it's a very similar system actually. The main difference is that these are built at the large assembly station, and there are additional rail cars available to be produced once you upgrade the station. Construct the locomotive, and then the cars individually after that, load them up onto a track, hook them up together, and you're on your merry way. The main locomotive for the large gauge is the BMS Black Bolt. The Black Bolt is capable of towing up to 14 rail cars behind it, and it has a crew of two, the driver's seat and the fireman's seat. The Black Bolt can function off coal stored in its inventory. However, there is a secondary car that can accompany the locomotive, the coal car. This can be loaded up with additional coal to fuel the train. The addition of this coal car allows the second seat in the Black Bolt, the fireman, to shovel extra coal into the engine. Doing this allows the train to boost its power and thus boost its speed, even with a full 15 car train load. Anyone or any light vehicles like LUVs or bikes that get caught in the way of this train will get demolished by it. The next train car is the flatbed car. Again, this acts the same way a flatbed truck would. 
You could store vehicles on it, you can store pallets of ammunition on it, you could store shipping containers on it. Note that the small shipping containers have been removed. We're all down to the large shipping containers once again. Something I forgot to mention earlier when talking about rails is that at present, in the Inferno update, you cannot build your own train lines across bodies of water. On each map, there are set rail bridges that are indestructible and not crossable with normal vehicles. The next car is the BMS Holdout. It's an infantry car meant for packing up to six infantry on board. It's also got attachment points on either side for tripod mounts. Whatever guns you can stick on a tripod, you can throw up onto these things. We're not done yet, though. If you upgrade the Large Vehicle Assembly Factory to a train assembly, you'll gain access, depending on your faction, to one of two faction-specific combat cars. The Colonials get the Aegis Steelbreaker K5A. It has a crew of four, a top-mounted high-velocity 40mm cannon, and two side-sponson 12.7mm machine guns. The Wardens get the O'Brien Warsmith B215, has a crew of six, and has dual 40mm cannons pointing forward and backwards, but can turn side to side. Available to both factions and built at the large assembly factory with the train assembly upgrade, you have the ability to build the Tempest Cannon RA-2. It's a mobile, long-range storm cannon, and obviously it's a 300mm storm cannon with a crew of one. It takes a good amount of enriched oil to power this thing up. The cannon will have to be detached and deployed in order to get a firing solution. With a maximum range of 500 meters and a narrow azimuth solution, this mobile storm cannon will be a force to reckon with, but it will also be limited in the preparation put into it. Not only do you have to spend the resources building this thing, but you gotta make sure the tracks actually align up with any targets you wish to hit. Just don't forget to undeploy, rechain your cannon to your train before heading off. Wouldn't want to leave this thing to the enemy. It's time for the namesake of this update, the Inferno. Inferno introduces fire weapons to Foxhole. Hans! 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 Sorry, mate, what was that? Hans! Das ganze Flammenwerfer! Alright, fine. Let's go burn them! Coming in the Infantry and Armored Vehicle Variety. Infantry variants for both Colonials and Wardens are the Molten Wind B2 Flame Torch for the Colonials, and the Willow's Bane Model 845 for the Wardens. Now the Infantry Flamethrowers come in two parts, the actual Flame Nozzle and the Backpack. And make no mistake, these two are different, but both of them can be produced at your standard factory in towns. There are some slight differences with these two. The Warden's Willow Bane can shoot slightly further, but the Colonial's Molten Wind has much more storage and can carry more fuel. You know what they say about the brightest lights burning the quickest. A step up from that, we've got the Flame Armored Vehicles. Their ammunition, on the other hand, comes from the oil refinery. The Colonials start off with the T-14 Vesta tankette. Got a crew of two, with the main armament being a flamethrower. The Wardens respond with the O'Brien B-130 Wildjack. Armored car, crew of two, main armament, the flamethrower. The Colonial H-19 Vulcan, light tank class, crew of three, and it's packing a heavy flamethrower. The distinction between flamethrowers and heavy flamethrowers are how far they can shoot their flames. The heavy ones being further. And finally, the Wardens have the Noble Firebrand Mark 17, tank destroyer class with a heavy flamethrower and a crew of three. Now, there's an important set of mechanics for fire weapons. First off, fire deals damage over time, not necessarily all at once. For infantry, that won't matter too much, as flames will kill you almost instantly, though you can still jump into water or be splashed by a friendly with a bucket full of water in order to save yourself. But in most cases, you're likely to perish pretty quickly. 
That being said, for buildings, it could be a little bit more devastating. If a building catches fire, it will take damage over time, until it is put out by, of course, a bucket brigade. Soldiers carrying buckets full of water, trying to splash the building, douse the flames. It's not just that either. Fire interacts with the game's weather systems. That means when it's colder during snow or when it's raining, things are less likely to catch fire. But more importantly, depending on wind direction, flames will spread in the direction of wind. That means if the wind is on your side, you might have to spend less effort burning an entire town to the ground. There's some new emplacements coming to Foxhole. The Colonials are losing the default emplacement guns, as those are considered to be the Warden guns. However, they're getting a whole new roster of emplacement guns to replace them. The DAE-1B-2 Sarah. Oh. It's fitted with triple MGs and is commanded by a crew of two. For their anti-tank role, the Colonials have the DAE-10-3 Polybus. It's got dual ARC RPG launchers with a crew of two. Nice. And lastly, the heavier 75mm emplacement, the DAE-2A-1 Ruptura. 75mm cannon, each shell must be loaded, and has a crew of two. Notice the lack of faceplate on this one. There will be zero protection if any enemies get within range. But not to be outdone, the Wardens are also adding on the Huber Starbreaker 94.5mm. Got a 94.5mm cannon, its turning radius is modest, and it's got a crew of one. Once again, the shells have to be loaded individually every time you fire, and the operator is fairly exposed. The heavy field guns. These use the larger caliber ammunition, now available to some of the later stage tanks. This includes the Colonial 945B Stygian Bolt heavy field gun. It takes a crew of two and fires a 94.5mm cannon. Next on the list is the Warden Balfour Stockade 75mm heavy field gun. It's got a crew of two and fires a 75mm cannon. Keep in mind though that the ammunition is rather large, so the shells will have to be single loaded every time you fire them. Alright, it's time to talk about a personal favorite, rocket artillery. This is a new type of artillery, specializing in long-range strikes, although they are rather imprecise. More of an area-of-denial type weapon. The munitions for rocket artillery can be produced at the ammunition factory with the rocket factory upgrade. Rocket artillery comes in three flavors, two for the Wardens and one for the Colonials. The Colonials get the R-17 Retiarius Skirmisher. It can carry up to 16 rockets, with a crew of two. The rocket platform is mounted on a truck, with the driver steering the vehicle and also choosing when to deploy it, while the passenger operates the rocket mechanism. And once deployed, you can fire your salvo at any interval you'd like. If you'd like to launch single rockets, you can. But of course, the best show is when you launch them all together. For the Wardens, there's a field variant known as the Riker 4-3-F Wasp Nest. It can carry 12 incendiary rockets with a crew of two, just like any field weapon. Lastly, the Wardens get a half-track mounted rocket system in the form of the Niska Riker Mark 9 Skycaller, and it can carry up to 17 incendiary rockets with a crew of two. Now, the important distinction here is that the Colonials will focus on damage with their rockets. However, the Wardens rely more on incendiary rockets, so expect less damage, but more chance of lighting fires with them. Reminder that for each of these rocket systems, each rocket has to be mounted and loaded individually. So it's a long setup, but a great payoff.
Now this last one technically straddles the line between emplacement and rocket artillery. It's the Colonial DAE-3B-2 Hades Net. It is an emplacement yeah, gun yeah. that fires rockets. It can load up to eight rockets and has a crew of one. Moving on up to some medium tanks. The Colonials are oversizing their falchion with the KV... <clears throat> sorry, the 85V-G Talos. It's a medium tank featuring an oversized 75mm cannon. It's got no secondary armaments, and it has a crew of four. Note that we're bringing back the battle tank crew slot of the engineer. This slot will be responsible for loading the shells into the tank. The 75mm cannon will do a lot of damage, and the engineer will be able to repair the tank during the fight without getting out of the vehicle. The Wardens, on the other hand, are coming out with another cruiser tank in the form of the Gallagher Thornfall Mark III. Similar to the Outlaw and the Highwayman, it's a cruiser tank featuring a crew of three. It's got twin 7.92mm storm guns as its main turret, but it has a secondary Calliope style bone saw launcher that can hold up to eight ARC RPG rounds. Do note that the bone saw rounds are operated by the tank commander. So the commander and the main gun will have to work in tandem so that the bone saws are pointed at the right direction. Hello, old friends. It's been a long time. Reintroducing the battle tanks. For the Colonials, it's the return of the Lance 36 battle tank. It's got a crew of five. It's fitted with a 75 millimeter main gun and a front facing 12.7 millimeter anti-infantry machine gun. For the Wardens, they get back the Flood Mark I battle tank, the crew of five, and a heavy duty 75 millimeter gun and a front facing 12.7 millimeter machine gun. Recall, the fifth crew member in these vehicles is the engineer, who loads the main gun and helps to repair during combat without getting out of the tank. But now, it's time for the battle tank's bigger brothers. Introducing a new class, the super tanks. The Colonials get the O-75B Ares. It's armed with dual 75mm turrets definitely isn't something from Warhammer, and it's got a crew of six. A driver, two gunners, a commander, and two engineers. The Wardens return fire with the Cullen Predator Mark III. Its main gun is a single rotating 94.5mm high-velocity cannon, and it's got secondary armaments of dual quad-barrel grenade launchers on the back that fire tremola grenades, and it's got a crew of six. Some other changes include Pallets are now constructible on their own at construction yards. You can then load them up with supplies as needed. Sandbags and barbed wire will now be created and loaded at facilities, then transported using pallets to their destination. It's also worth noting that pallets can stack more items on top of them than they could before, so you'll have to make fewer trips. Storage rooms and bunkers have been changed to accommodate more items. They're no longer just used for ammunition and shells. They can store things like tripods or tripod-mounted weaponry, along with a few other things from this update, making them more useful and, if stacked properly, can be used to quickly deploy or undeploy defenses. Vehicle subsystem status icons are now red when they are disabled. The main menu has been revamped, and faction music and a main menu soundtrack have been added. 
there were plenty of balances and bug fixes along with this update. But I think we're running long enough, so I'll save that for the patch notes down below. Now I realize, in fact I guarantee I've missed something in this update. Anything I've missed, I will post in a pinned comment in the comment sections down below. Thank you everyone for sticking around this long. If you liked the update video, like, share, and subscribe. It really goes a long way to help. And so we come to the end of a long road, but now we've got our own roads to build, and railways on top of that. I want to say a huge thanks to all the Foxholes community members who have helped me along the way, or even just had some laughs or some really good moments in-game. I really appreciate all of the support I've gotten over the years from devs, fellow streamers, and regular community members all alike. This is by far the longest I've ever worked on an update video, and I was crazy enough to do 7 videos in 7 days leading up to this, plus a 12 hour stream just on the horizon. But come on, what are you waiting for? Put on your helmet, grab your flamethrower, good luck, keep your heads down, and stay in your foxhole. Bear out. <laughs>